think we can get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to City and Regional Planning's uh, bi-weekly regional uh, research seminar lecture series. Today, we have the honor of having Professor Kate Lowe from University of Illinois Chicago speaking with us. And it is a session that has been organized by um, Professor Nick Klein, and he will be introducing our guest. Just before I hand it over, I wanted to call out, as you can see on our shared screen, the upcoming lectures that we have in our series. The next week's lecture will be a colloquium lecture with Professor Julian Agiman of Tufts University speaking on just sustainabilities and policy planning and practice. He is one of the foremost leaders on the issues of equity and sustainability, and I anticipate he will be able to deliver a very interesting and provocative talk on some of the contemporary issues of our time. The next research seminar series that we have will be with Professors Mark Lubel of UC Davis and Professor Xavier Brasurdo of Duke University. And they'll be talking about the future of commons research and planning. Both of them have done significant research, especially in areas of natural resources. Xavier Brasurdo on fisheries in Mexico and Central America, Mark Lubel on a whole range of issues from agriculture and climate adaptation, sea level rise to water systems management. They have very different perspectives on issues of commons research, um, more, some of them more from a Hardin approach, some from a more uh, Eleanor Ostrom approach. Xavier Brasurdo was a student of uh, Dr. Eleanor Ostrom. And so they'll be debating and discussing the futures of common research and planning. And I think that'll be a really interesting research seminar talk. I also realized that I have been quite remiss in not having thanked so far in our series to people who have been very important to all of our success in managing the colloquium and the talks. And one of them is our own Chris Hinman, who has been helping to organize and to communicate with all of our speakers, and this would not be possible without him. And the other is Alviano Stinson, who has been managing all of our Canvas and our Zoom meetings. So my gratitude to both Chris and Alviano for their help. All right, without further ado, let me introduce Professor Nick Klein. Nick Klein's research contributes to two central areas of transportation planning, understanding the factors that influence how people travel on a daily basis and how these changes play out over the course of their lives. His work focuses on marginalized populations and neighborhoods that use transit, walk, and bike at high rates. And by studying the factors that influence how people in these communities travel on a daily basis and how their travel evolves over many years, his work offers new perspectives for planners, policymakers and researchers on issues of equity and sustainability in transportation. He had his PhD degree from the Edward J. Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy at Rutgers, a master's in urban spatial analytics from UPenn, and a bachelor's in operations research and industrial engineering from Cornell. Nick? Thanks, Linda. Um, so I'm really excited today that we uh, have, uh, we're able to host uh, Kate Lowe from the University of Illinois Chicago. Um, one of the perks of our job, my job, is uh, being faculty here is that I get to suggest scholars to come give talks for a research seminar. Um, and I'm fairly selfish about this. I always choose people who I'm a big fan of, uh, people that I want to hear what they're doing, what the latest things that they're working on are, uh, people whose work I really admire and always look forward to reading. Um, and Kate is a terrific example of that. I've been following Kate's year, work for, for several years. Um, and I'll read her bio in a minute, but I just want to emphasize that I think that, uh, you know, I think Kate's work is some of the most exciting and interesting work around issues about transportation equity in planning um, that is happening in academia and in, um, has really good influences for policy as well. Um, and so I'll let me talk a little bit before I read her bio about sort of the format of today. It's a little bit different. Um, my name is on the banner as if I'm headlining with Kate, but this is obviously her show. Right, we invited her here to come and present her research. I wanted to, um, you know, I'm encouraged by Linda and others to change up the format a little bit. And so I thought I would let, we would have Kate present her research and then I would ask her some questions sort of more in a uh, interview style. Uh, I'll lead off the questions and some about her research in general that we're talking about, uh, the specific research and then more broadly about transportation methods. Um, during the conversation, uh, you can ask questions in the chat um, if you have them during. I, I don't know that Kate will actually answer any of them. They might hold them. To, we might hold them to later. 
Um, I'll moderate the Q&A afterwards. If you want to ask a question, please raise your hand and I'm happy to call on you. So let me introduce Kate. Uh, Kate uh, Lowe, who has her PhD uh, from Cornell in 2011, studies transportation at the intersection of policy, funding, and social equity. Her work examines how varied stakeholders and transportation policies interact across different levels of government and how this impacts transportation investments. Much of her work has focused on how federal funding programs <clears throat> interface with local funding with an emphasis on equity implications. She also studies the transportation perspectives and experiences of low-income populations and has completed work on low-income households in Louisiana. More recently, she has turned to racial dynamics and local investment choices around streetcars, as well as Chicago-based qualitative research on low and moderate income communities of color. She has a PhD in city and regional planning from Cornell University, an MA in community development and planning from Clark University, and a BA in cultural anthropology from Bard College. And Hi, I, I think I'm at the tail end, but you muted yourself, so I'll take that as a cue that I'm on. Um, thank you so much with that really generous introduction, and thank you for the invite. Of course, it would be great to be back in Swibley Hall, but we're in a new reality here. Um, the work that I'll be talking about relates to the last component of my research interest that Professor Klein talked about, and that's commuting in context, um, looking at brown and black uh, entry level workers in Chicago land. I'm going to move to the share screen and bring up my PowerPoint. Um, I probably won't be able to see too many chat comments. I don't manage that well when I'm sharing screen. So I will come back to your chats in the later components of our discussion. So I'm going to move to the share screen now. So this project uh, comes out of a larger umbrella collaboration between Equiticity and um, our mobility justice in Chicago research and Jesus Rojas, who's at UC Davis, is one of the other co-researchers in that bigger project. And this particular component that I'll be talking about today was also done in collaboration with the Metropolitan Planning Council, which is a Chicago-based nonprofit. And uh, I want to give acknowledgement of our phenomenal research assistant on this, Chelsea Korn. She actually did the heavy lifting of the analysis and writing for the report. So today I'm going to be doing a pretty standard structure before we get into the Q&A with, uh, with Nick and the larger audience. I'm going to talk about existing research and the evolution of what's called the spatial mismatch idea. I'm going to touch a little on the motivation for this work. I'll give you some background on the Chicago context. Uh, I'll discuss then the methods and participants, and I'm happy to talk uh, more about this at, in the Q&A. Um, I don't go into the weeds in this presentation of some of the challenges and benefits of partnerships and community-based partnerships, but I'm happy to talk about that. I'll then discuss key themes from the research. I'll end with conclusions and then I'll extrapolate out a little bit from this work um, and talk about its significance for transportation planning more generally. So if you're in a transportation planning class or perhaps as well in a community development class, you've probably heard discussions of what's been called the spatial mismatch. This is a term that Keane identified going all the way back to the 1960s. And there's several fundamental premises of this spatial mismatch um, that he identified. He noted how uh, jobs had decentralized, uh, that housing discrimination kept black households in the central city cores, and that employment discrimination in these conditions resulted in poor job prospects and outcomes. And this map depicts what the Metropolitan Planning Organization in Chicago terms economically disconnected areas in blue and major employment centers so we can see some spatial dispersion. And while some aspects of the spatial mismatch remain true to today, and we'll talk about some critiques, we've actually seen a lot of suburbanization 
of low-income households, as well as black and brown residents. Although black and brown residents have suburbanized at slower rates than white households, nevertheless, job sprawl has outpaced uh, population decentralization. And discussions of the spatial mismatch have resulted in three main policy approaches. One, this idea of moving jobs to the central cities or developing them in those locations. The second, there's been a push to move or develop affordable housing in the suburbs. And the third main area of response has been to move commuters. Um, and that idea is associated with what was called the Job Access and Reverse Commute Program that followed welfare reform in the 90s and now has been folded into some other job programs. Responding to JARC and other interventions to support reverse commutes, Evelyn Blumenberg, now almost 20 years ago, pointed out that a long reverse commute to the suburbs might not align with the preferences, choices, and constraints of current and former welfare recipients. She pointed out that women welfare recipients frequently choose work sites close to their home locations or childcare, um, and that they have childcare and other household responsibilities. Furthermore, um, and I'll explain the context for this map in just a moment, uh, she pointed out that central cities are still sites where there's high density of jobs um, and have many entry level jobs that align with the skill sets of welfare recipients. Um, and what this map shows, it's from the smart location database uh, that is not being updated, but had a whole rich set of layers available um, easily. What this map shows is the number of jobs available within a 45 minute transit ride. And we see here in DC that the very center and the district overall has great job access relative to the suburbs. However, um, the central city advantage is complicated by escalating housing prices. I've actually, I uh, have a forthcoming paper that looks at Washington DC and uh, DC housing prices and other shifts have escalated and there's actually been a dramatic decrease in the share of black city residents. Um, as there has been in New Orleans, which is depicted here. Um, and this is from exploratory research I did several years ago. Um, uh, the focus on reverse commuting and a spatial mismatch between central city residents didn't align with what I found in interviews in New Orleans. Um, this map shows employment density and we can see it's darkest uh, near the river um, and that's the central business district and French Quarter that some of you might be familiar with. And um, the orange squares show respondents who said no I haven't missed job opportunities due to transportation. So I was actually a little surprised that so many reported not missing job opportunities. But what we see is, um, and this is not a, a large enough data set to make generalization, but we see those that were less uh, approximately located to the central city more often reported missing job opportunities due to transportation. And more generally, um, there's been discussions of whether the mismatch for entry level workers is really spatial or modal. So Joe Grangs also noticed some continued benefit to central city locations um, in his analysis of job access from central city locations within the city of Detroit. Uh, what he found is that central locations offer superior access via transit, but access via transit is overwhelmed by high access via automobile. And what this chart shows is access. Um, he created a job accessibility index, and we see that on the y-axis. Um, and we see the distance from the central business district on the x-axis. And what we see is transit in the red triangles. We see very close into the center of the city, pronounced high access via transit that quickly levels out. But that access via auto in the blue circles is dramatically higher. 
So that's part of why he, along with Blumenberg, uh, suggests that we think about job access mismatches as modal, not just spatial. Um, and in other Louisiana-based work I did with Tim Mosby, um, we talked about a, a whole host of other factors that compound challenges coordinating transportation and job access. So we argue for expanding what we think about when we consider transportation and low-income workers, um, and that we think about lived experiences. Um, for example, one important dimension of entry-level work is alignment of schedules, and this is especially challenging for transit users. Um, and in the metros that we did research, Baton Rouge and Lafayette, we don't see the transit service levels of even New Orleans, let alone where I'm based in Chicago. And to accommodate infrequent schedules and workplace demands, workers sometimes had to arrive excessively early to work. So they experienced what we term a regressive transportation time tax because of these coordinating factors. There's also a lot of stress associated with unreliability of transit. Um, low income households often have unreliable vehicles, which can also cause challenges. And receiving rides can be an important mode of transportation and that also had reliability problems. And we argue this causes stress and stress is another negative impact of these transportation work challenges. And we argue for thinking about well-being, not just getting to the job and turn um, the idea of a conceptual mismatch of what we think about when we think about workforce transportation accessibility. So this, these broader conversations in the transportation research were certainly part of the motivation for this work, but this is also part of broader interest and partnerships when we think about how qualitative work rather can be a complement to the existing tools we have and how we need to explain or rather understand the lived experiences of black and brown entry-level work. So uh, here I've shown a clip of a really powerful tool that actually one of my colleagues created. It allows us to quickly map out accessibility to key destinations here. I've selected jobs. It also allows hospitals, parks, schools. Uh, it allows the selection of mode, which is so important given how dramatically different access is by these modes. Departure time, which affects accessibility levels and a travel time threshold. Uh, this shows 45 minutes like that smart location database tool. So these are very powerful for showing some inequities, but we haven't heard enough directly from people experiencing challenges and inequities to understand whether we have the whole picture. So that's part of this partnership with Equiticity on the mobility justice in Chicago work more generally, and uh, with MPC to understand uh, transportation and workforce accessibility specifically. And I want to flag that this phase of research is more to outline whether we're understanding the right problems and seeking to address the right problems rather than delineate and compare specific policy solutions. I also want to contrast this qualitative work with quantitative studies this work allows really in-depth exploration with a smaller number of participants than larger quantitative studies. So now I'll give a little more background on Chicago. Um, unfortunately, I didn't adapt for Zoom viewing, so depending on the view, you might have a little cutoff on the right, so you might not see where the lake is in Chicago. But uh, this is a map, a racial dot density map, of the city of Chicago, which has a population of 2.7 million residents, making it, for now, the third largest city in the US. It is almost 33% non-Latinx white, 30% non-Latinx black, 29% Latinx, 6% Asian, and 2% other races or ethnicities. Um, and on, like Washington DC and New Orleans, Chicago has actually experienced a massive loss of black population. It ranks fifth nationally for combined racial and economic spatial segregation and is rife with inequities, unfortunately, like most American cities. 
one metric of these inequities is the differential unemployment rates. Black unemployment rates are more than four times and Latinx unemployment rates double white unemployment rates in the city. And this isn't simply explainable by education as black Chicagoans with graduate or professional degrees have higher rates of unemployment than white residents with four-year degrees. And this map shows the stark but nuanced racial spatial divides in the city. Low and moderate income Black and Latinx residents are concentrated on the south and west side of the cities. The city and slight residential segregation jobs have distinct uh, geographic patterns. For those without a college degree, the vast majority of well compensated jobs are located outside of city boundaries. Um, and another aspect of Chicago is Mo choice. Um, and this it, data is from the census transportation planning products. And I want to flag that it groups together uh, all non white Latinx uh, residents and commuters, which of course is uh, obscures important difference within racial groups. Uh, for example, work shows different bicycling rates between Black and Latinx commuters. Like most of the United States, in Chicago, auto commuting is dominant. But among alternative modes, we see racial patterns. Um, buses, if you're taking a transportation class, you know in Latin America, buses can be really quick and high quality in some cases. In Chicago, bus service is not bus rapid transit um, and is disproportionately used by black and brown commuters. However, thousands of white non-Latinx commuters use bus service as well. Um, and the L is the local term for the heavy rail system, which is disproportionately used by white non-Latinx commuters, although of course not exclusively so. Um, those systems provide really different speed and access quality. So that's another important dimension that will relate to some of the findings from this work. So now I'm going to shift a little into our data collection and participants. So this work looked at workforce accessibility among disadvantaged workers. Our target was to think about racial dynamics. So we wanted to especially hear from black and brown workers, but we didn't exclude workers. We did on-site uh, recruitment at five job centers that are operated by the Chicago Coke Workforce Partnership. We did brief intake surveys with closed-end questions and demographic questions. We held 10 job seeker focus groups and five job coach focus groups at the five sites. Job seeker focus groups average eight participants and we had conversations with 82 total. The focus groups generally lasted around 70 minutes, but range from just over an hour to 90 minutes. Um, and we also interviewed or had focus groups with those 42 job coaches as well. Women, black individuals, and those without a college degree were highly represented among the job seeker participants. Women, in fact, accounted for almost 70% of participants. The remainder were men. No respondents reported a non-binary gender identity. This map shows the focus group sites as well as the residential zip codes of the participants. You can see that the focus groups were on the south and west sides of the city with one exception. If you go kind of center, north center near the lake, uh, which is on the right, we held, we held one focus group at a job center in the loop, which is the local name for the downtown. Um, and most of the participants lived on the south and west sides, though not exclusively, and a few actually resided outside of the city of Chicago. As I mentioned, Black participants were especially represented in the job seeker focus groups. Most respondents were Black, in fact, 78%. The second largest group was Latinx respondents with 9%. And the vast majority of participants did not have a four-year college degree, 81%. Over 90%
reported a household income below 50,000. That was kind of a demarcation of the approximate median income of the city. A significant majority, actually just under 71% of respondents reported an income of below 30%. So that's the data collection background as well as some demographics of the participants. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about how we handled the data. So we recorded and had each focus group transcribed and we used the inductive collaborative coding process. So our research partners were essential in identifying key themes. We all read all the transcriptions and made lists of what we thought the most prominent themes were. Um, and the transcriptions, rather than predetermined categories, determined what we coded in the transcriptions. Uh, Chelsea, the research assistant on this, did the important and sometimes unexciting work of going line by line in the transcriptions and flagging every time a theme came up so that we could then query those themes and summarize them. There's a, a report online that details the findings in each coding category. We created codes separately for the job coach transcriptions versus the job seeker transcriptions. But as this Venn diagram shows, there are some themes common to both types. So I'm not going to go through every theme, um, although I'm happy to point people to them. I'm going to talk about some major cross-cutting themes and how they relate to policy discussions. So this image shows a piece bus, which is the bus service that serves Chicagoland suburbs, and this respondents talked about. They said if you're putting in, let's say, an hour and a half, and that's minimum of pace time from home to any job, that's three hours there and back for an eight-hour shift, you have to really wonder how much of your day that occupies. So this it, time example and other aspects of the experience, often two hours of commuting, showed that for respondents, transportation is a significant burden. They reported commute times that are far beyond the standard metrics of 45 or even 60 minutes used for assessing job accessibility. And this is in part because of buffer time for aligning commutes with workplace scheduling and as well concerns with reliability. And those with disabilities had added challenges. As a result, almost three quarters of respondents told us that transportation barriers kept them from getting or keeping a job. That question was in that brief survey that we used uh, upon intake for the focus groups. So, Respondents reported serious problems with the transit experience, including cleanliness, ease of transfers, fare payment, reliability of service, time burden, maintenance of elevators, especially important for those with disabilities, information and security, which we'll talk about more in a few slides. That's why we argue enhancements for the transit customer experience are critical. If it's a poor experience, workers may dismiss transit as, as an option. This therefore hurts ridership levels for the transit agency and job prospects for workers. More funding for transit is needed to address the customer experience factor that the transit agencies directly control, along with partnerships to address the contextual factors that significantly impact the customer experience, but are outside transit agency control. And as I said, we'll come to that a bit later. Um, and we had a, a question in the focus group guide specifically around bicycling and walking. And because of that question, biking and walking came up in every focus group. However, outside of responses to those specific questions, respondents hardly ever brought up biking and walking. Very few walked or biked to the focus group sites, less than 8% combined. Respondents specified some improvements possible for each mode, but yet the tone of the conversation was they didn't really see biking and walking as viable modes for job access. 
even though some respondents uh, like policy discussions recognize health benefits of active transportation. But the focus group participants identified different safety barriers to different modes. For bicycling, participants repeatedly noted traffic danger and a lack of infrastructure that would support it. That's why I chose this picture. Um, so this is a major street that goes almost all the way to the loop and connects to the loop. Um, and this is a picture from a Southwest side community, a majority Latinx community. Um, and what I've done is I've blown up by that white van. There's a bike rack that is empty because the infrastructure and the landscape for biking poses significant traffic risk. For walking, however, a different type of safety concern came up. That was danger from violence or crime um, and respondents wanted to feel more safe. In addition to these safety issues, respondents talked about simple proximity problems. They thought walking and biking were not always feasible because of the distance to job sites. And they talked about a, a desire for more businesses and jobs in their communities within walking distance. So with that, I'll shift into talking about security and safety. The focus group guide did not contain any questions that directly address security, yet the theme of security from violence came up in every focus group. Respondents primarily discussed these safety concerns related to public transportation and walking, and the impact of these security concerns include duress, foregone opportunities, and a mode shift away from walking or transit. Of course, concerns about violence varied by time of day and locations. Um, findings on security suggest that analyses of workforce accessibility and transportation that don't consider concerns around violence will overlook the constraints that respondents face around mobility and overestimate job access. And individuals, of course, are adaptive um, and they uh, change their behaviors due to security concerns. Like this respondent quoted here, I can afford a truck, but the past few years I had to divvy up because I have seen shootings on the transportation system. There they are referring to the mass transit or public transit system. And I just had to go ahead and bite the bullet and take care of it for my safety reasons. And of course, automobile use has serious environmental uh, trade-offs, but getting rides, driving, and ride hailing can be very rational adaptation amid current realities. Professor Klein's work shows that automobile ownership is actually associated with higher earnings, so it's a complicated dynamic for low-income households around automobile access. Um, as I said, uh, in addition to mode, choice impacts violence can cause delays and dur duress. This respondent said, like I said, I was just on the bus and there was a fight that broke out and I was like, oh Lord, just looking back, just get to my stop, please. And one thing I struggled with as a researcher was how to narrate and respond to these concerns around violence and crime. I, for example, didn't want to put up a crime map for this presentation because Crime discussions often stigmatize neighborhoods um, and ways crime is narrated are entangled with perceptions and racism and fear. So that's why there's no imagery associated with these slides. Um, and Equiticity, one of our research partners, has actually been really out front on pushing to take policing out of uh, Vision Zero plans. We can talk about that in the Q&A. Vision Zero plans are plans to eliminate uh, traffic deaths, especially focus on bike and pedestrian experiences. And out of this research, we do not recommend increased policing given the documented racism in it and the criminal justice system. As a workforce mobility study, as a transportation researcher, I don't claim to have the specific policy interventions to address the violence. Um, but we assert the need to work at the root causes of violence and uh, take the lead from social justice movements that are leading 
racially just transformations to more broadly address violence systematically and at the cause rather than sy symptomatically. Um, so there is a geography of access and opportunity that aligns with the spatial mismatch dialogue. This job coach explained, I'm just going to be honest, you got to get out of the south side in order to find work and get it at a decent wage. And this map um, actually cuts off the north side of Chicago. You'll often see maps of Chicago that cut off the south side, which goes very far south. Um, but what you can see is where the highest job density is in the loop. Um, quickly thins out as uh, you visually go south on this map. Um, and with the geography of access and opportunity, we found that many jobs are just simply inaccessible for those without cars, as well as uh, scheduling difficulties, some uh, pace routes, those are the bus routes that serve the suburban locations. Some of those routes just don't go on Sundays. And we heard about one woman who lost her job she could get there every day except her one Sunday a month. Um, and that's why respondents reported and we see multiple potential benefits, including but not limited to job access from the development of quality jobs on the south and west sides and support of existing and new businesses. We envision a scenario in which a suburban commute for quality work is a choice rather than a necessity. And respondents are cognizant of inequities. Um, here's uh, the Belmont station depicted here. Uh, the Belmont station is part of a project of over a billion dollars to increase frequency on the north side, several miles north of the loop, and it is served by three different train lines. Um, so this respondent said, so there are more trains and buses running through the north side to make sure people are on time for work versus the south side or the west side. And that's like a huge issue. We all use the system and we all need it to be reliable. And respondents also talked about the role of employers. For example, this respondent explained, as did others, they say, if you have reliable transport and then you write, oh, well, that must mean, can I get on public transportation and come to the job? And you write, oh yeah, public transportation, but they don't consider that reliable, so they dropped their application for that. So um, we found that employers have hiring biases that are sometimes based on address or transportation modes, and they may drop applicants that use public transportation and don't have private automobile access. Participants suggested employer-side solutions with the broadest benefits would be for employers to move closer to employee locations. Or alternatively, employers could better align work hours with public transit, connect to L uh, rail hubs, or allow more scheduling flexibility. However, employer-driven transportation support is more common for a high-wage workers. We recognize um, there's a new economic and public health landscape. We did this research before COVID and the dramatic employment and economic impacts. However, we think job intermediaries and planners uh, like many in this audience could help make the case around employer benefits from supporting entry level and disadvantaged workers transportation needs. And respondents identify transportation barriers that reflect longstanding inequitable investments and policies across spheres and across silos that have created and continue to create barriers to employment, especially on the south and west sides. One respondent was explicit and called for reparations, while others called for better quality jobs in close proximity. That's why we argue addressing transportation challenges can and must involve non-transportation solutions, even as equitable transit investment targeting black and brown communities is vital. In short, solutions must be comprehensive and involve meaningful empowered engagement with communities. And near-term adaptations need to recognize these different challenges and perhaps include user subsidies. 
Ultimately, there is a need for targeted investment across transportation modes, new decision making and community engagement processes, and holistic strategies that provide direct investment. But in transportation, but also go much further to directly challenge structural racism and address these interlocking systems and experiences across policy arenas. That's why we argue partnerships in and far beyond transportation are critical for addressing mobility and racial justice. So with that takeaway from this research, I also want to talk briefly about how we can think about local knowledge and the scope of transportation informed by this work. So another aspect of this work is the importance of community knowledge. So through this work and a collaborative research approach, we identified different barriers and approaches um, that qualitative work enabled. Participants helped us expand the boundaries of our thinking and how we conceptualize transportation. And more broadly in planning and especially transportation planning, we have to think about different types of knowledge. This infographic is by the Untokening, which is a national multiracial mobility justice group. And it asserts the need to value community voices as essential data um, and contrasts that with a reliance on quantitative data in the transportation realm. That's why in other work, I argue that issues and knowledge for which there is not a GIS shapefile or a quantitative metric are still critical for transforming processes and the ends of transportation planning. And then another piece that this work helped me think about is what is the scope of transit and transportation planning? And this is an area that I haven't really codified, but I've been thinking about based on some of the responses to a webinar in which we presented this work and our research partner NPC presented their work on equity performance measures. What we heard from participants is that problems and solutions go beyond transportation infrastructure and services. So this raises the question is, what is the scope of transportation planning? This slide um, was used in a webinar by a research partner, um, and it's mapping out commute differences and comparing that to racial geography. We can see the Chicago boundaries where the qualitative work I presented was focused, um, but it's within the broader Chicagoland region. So this map shows the 100 census tracts with the longest commutes, in red. Um, those were an average of 44 minutes each way. Um, and 95 of those 100 are majority Black or Latinx. And the median income is $31,000. The majority of the shortest commute tracks, although it's not um, as concentrated as the long commutes, or 53 out of 100 are majority white, and the median income is over $75,000. Um, and of course, Median income and average values for spatial units like census tracts obscure a lot of variability. But um, still give us part of a picture of commute burden. And um, a prominent transit planner in response to this said it conflated transit problems with spatial and land use problems. Um, and I similarly talked to one of the alums from our program who was frustrated by the use of this slide as well, since uh, these inequities and commute modes and racial patterns reflect mode choice, who's driving, who's using transit, and land use patterns and locations of employment, these inequities aren't solely the cause of transit provision. However, I found those responses really interesting, but I argue that if our goal is to address racial justice and transit equity and transportation inequity more broadly, we should still look at how transportation is entangled and how can transportation help these inequities and I would argue we shouldn't try and exclude them. I certainly think it's helpful to delineate contributing factors. Is it mode? Is it provision? Is it land use? 
but I would encourage future transportation planners to still say, how can transportation be part of addressing these inequities, even if the genesis of the problem isn't solely transit provision? So those are some concluding thoughts informed by this research. And with that, I am going to stop screen sharing and give it over to Professor Klein to hear some responses and questions. Um, thanks so much, Kate. Uh, thanks for presenting this great research. I, I think all of us are, are going to have a lot of questions. I see some piping up in the chat. Um, I wanted to start with asking a, a couple of questions sort of about sort of your research broadly and then how this research fits in. Um, so you published an article or just went online the other day. I'm going to post it in the chat in case people are interested um, in uh, transport reviews called Undone Science Funding and Positionality in Transportation Research. And I think you're alluding to that at the end of the, the paper, um, but in that, in, I'm sorry, at the end of the presentation, uh, but in this paper, which I really liked and enjoyed and thought it was really challenging and thoughtful for thinking about the transportation research, um, I think it helped us understand sort of how we as transportation researchers are often, or not necessarily us, but many transportation researchers are often limited in the questions they ask. Um, and I was hoping you could step back from your research and talk a little bit about sort of the research you presented within the context of that article and um, think a little bit or, or talk a little bit about sort of what you learned in this study um, that you would not have learned had you approached this topic with a more traditional positivist quantitative lens and conversely sort of what such a study might look like and what it would have sort of foreground and, and sort of missed essentially. Right? And, I, and I say this, um, I think I, I mentioned this to you before, you know, I often talk to our peers, right, uh, who are doing transportation research and many of whom don't do qualitative research. Um, and I sort of like to point out to them that like they could learn new things, right? It's a very self-interested motivation for doing qualitative research, right? You could find some different things out if you ask qualitative research. Um, and, you know, I think, I think often there's a resistance to doing that for many reasons. Um, so I was wondering if you could sort of step back and talk about this broader issues and that paper a little bit more specifically. Um, and the, the three themes in that paper are sort of questions about funding, questions about positionality, and then questions about methods. Okay, I'm going to try and tackle that, um, but feel free to ask follow-ups if I don't hit on all the themes embedded in that. Um, I'll first talk a little bit about the evolution of my thinking. So I think this work helped me understand more where one of my advocacy partners was coming from. So um, my advocacy research partner, and this is Equiticity, um, which was founded by Obai Reed. Um, and I first connected with him because of his work uh, to get policing out of Vision Zero. And his powerful work on racial violence and anti-Blackness and policing made me really rethink how I had accepted the paradigms of enforcement as part of promoting pedestrianism and bicycling. So that's how that, that relationship began. But what I heard him talk about was all these issues, even though he identified as being focused on mobility and transportation. And going through this work and partnering with him um, helped really evolve my thinking about how broadly I needed to think about transportation and lived experiences. So as a researcher, um, and as a, a privileged white individual, I hadn't understood how much mobility and stress are mitigated by violence. Um, and that is one of the key findings from this report. But I think that partnership is really important, um, both qualitative methods and engaging local knowledge and partners, because we had input in how we designed the focus group instrument. So feedback in both substantive and stylistic comments is really important. And um, so 
the important mitigating role of violence and violence as a stressor and how that infuses the whole transportation experience were really important, as well as this kind of dismissive role of biking and walking. Respondents had really rational reasons for dismissing those modes, but it doesn't align with a lot of the policy conversations. Also, um, this adaptation around ride hailing is really interesting in my Another research strand I have is looking at ride hailing and wow, does ride hailing have some massive externalities and environmental problems, but we learned how people adapt. And I also think it's really important to recognize um, those experiencing employment, transportation barriers as uh, resources and actors in solving the problems, um, they were very conversant. They didn't use the term spatial mismatch, but they were well aware of spatial mismatch. So it, it really uh, emphasized for me that as well. So um, I transformed my thinking a lot through this project um, and both qualitative methods and partnerships were important for that. In terms of funding, um, we were funded from the Chicago Community Trust for this work, and I was surprised how receptive they were to qualitative methods. Quantitative methods are get a lot of traction in policy circles, and it is nice to be able to make a clear statement. It is powerful to make a map and see uh, differential experiences. But it was funding through this uh, uh, foundation that enabled us to do this work. Um, but they, you know, part of their funding agenda is addressing the wealth gap. So, um, and part of our partnership was really interested in workforce accessibility. So, um, the work and partnership with Equiticity wasn't originally so focused on work for accessibility, but these partnerships and funding did make us think about workforce accessibility, although not exclusively so. We have another report that looks more broadly at mobility, but um, Joe Grangs has some important work on how we shouldn't just think about workforce accessibility, but funding interests both in the public and nonprofit sector have fostered a lot of work in that particular arena. Um, Positionality. Um, I mean, I think my my experience as a privileged white person made me oblivious to um, this the constant stress of violence and how inhibiting that is. I think some of us are newly thinking about safety and experiences um, with a more prominent role of uprisings this summer. So I think this work aligns with some broader policy shifts. But I think I was oblivious to certain roles of safety and policing because of my uh, positionality. There's a, a great book called Suspect Citizen that talks about traffic stops and policing um, and how uh, white um, economically privileged individuals don't understand the tremendous uh, role of traffic enforcement sites. And all, although Jesus Barajas has done some powerful work on that, he's presenting today if you want to hit another seminar on bicycling while black and um, the ACLU has done some work in Illinois. Um, so funding shaped some of our focus. Positionality um, made me oblivious, but qualitative methods allowed me to not uh, not limit that that could come up um, and our inductive coding process meant that was a prominent theme whereas if we had already had five coding categories we were going to use violence wasn't going to be one of them um, so i guess that intersects with with methods as well so i think that hits on most of your questions but feel free to ask a follow-up um, and I see there's a lot in the chat box. Um, and I apologize. I am interested in your questions, but I might not be able to keep up with all of them. 
Um, thanks so much. Uh, I think you answered my question very well and it sort of went on much more than I could have imagined. I also uh, don't envy you having to sort of look at the chat box while you're talking and trying to make articulate statements. Um, so I had another sort of question about qualitative methods in, in general and sort of, um, you know, in the paper uh, that I, met, I referenced, the Undone Science paper, um, one thing that you sort of tangentially discuss, but don't talk about that much from a personal experience, which I, I would be very curious to hear is sort of your own experiences with the acceptability of doing qualitative research in transportation and gatekeeping at conferences or in journals or in, job, in the job market. Um, to the extent that you feel comfortable, I see you're laughing. And I'll just say that with one experience I had, which was um, the first time I presented at the uh, ACSP conference, which uh, is the sort of academic planning conference in the US, um, I presented qualitative research and a very well known transportation um, uh, planner, a senior academic was moderating the session. And after I presented, he said that I was very brave to present qualitative research, um, which at the time I just thought was, I didn't know how to make it. I didn't know how to take it, but over the years, it sat with me uh, less and less well, right? Um, as a sort of example of like, what is an acceptable type of transportation research to present at an academic conference and what is gonna be um, embraced with open arms and what is gonna be questioned. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your own experiences uh, with publishing and doing. So, um, so I, I really didn't want um, the paper that you referenced around undone science to just be sour grapes. Um, but my experiences um, did influence my interest in writing it. Um, I had, so um, I want to concede, is my work always the most amazing in the world? No. So, uh, but is it, has it been, it, I had one paper that was desk rejected because there were only 50 participants. And 50 participants is actually not quite a few for qualitative analysis. Um, but it's the same response I got from um, someone at a conference when there were like 50 participants. So um, that's why uh, I added that component earlier on when I was talking about the methods of contrasting qualitative and quantitative, because I don't want to hold individuals responsible for dismissing a small number if they've never heard that a small number makes sense for different kinds of studies. Um, and so my goal in the paper, was it a little cathartic? Yes, but the bigger goal <laughs> is to start a conversation and how can we value different contributions. Um, and I cite work by Anne Forsyth who talks about different cultures within planning. And she says, let's be conversant so we can recognize high quality planning that's not in our subculture, but it's also okay to call out poor quality planning outside our subculture. But let's understand different markers of quality for different types of work. And uh, let's also recognize different values for different types of work. Um, and one thing that's come up with uh, my research collaborator and advocacy organization is how powerful quantitative, well, GIS maps can be. And we very much expect a whole host of different transportation metrics to be the same map again. And I saw someone post about this in Chicago again. You'll see the same patterns in Chicago again and again of south and west sides not getting equitable investment. But there's a couple of reasons to still do those maps and to use those tools that rely on quantitative data. One is sometimes we get unexpected answers. So it's still important to do the analysis because sometimes we get surprising patterns. And secondly, they're really powerful and being able to cite and show that data is still really important. So, and um, I saw some, that map I used of my colleagues work about job access. I think it's an amazing tool. I saw it un negatively characterized and I don't want to suggest that it's not an amazing tool. I just want to recognize the value of other methods and frameworks for broadening the discussion. 
Uh, great. I, I think I have maybe one or two more questions before we open it up and let other people talk. I don't want to dominate the, the time. Um, I wanted to know sort of if we think about uh, qualitative methods, right? Um, I'm thinking about training and pedagogy for transportation planners, right? Not just academics, but planners writ large. But I think often when we look at transportation classes, um, or what I've seen of transportation class, classes, they rarely utilize quantitative methods, but they might take uh, some sort of data analysis perspective, right? There might be some sort of problem sets or some sort of data that people have to analyze, some expectation. There are often classes on using specific modeling software, right, or suites of software. Um, but rarely do I have I seen um, transportation planning classes uh, use explicitly use qualitative methods um, as a way to train our planners um, and I wonder or train train new planners and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what that might look like and if and how you have done that um, or are thinking about doing that in the future so in my teaching I haven't done a method specifically for transportation planners um, but I think it's relevant for planning largely I, not all of us are going to be yeah, specialists and not every planner coming out of a pro program is going to focus on qualitative methods but it's good to have some exposure across the board and i think because of some disciplinary traditions and the field's origins in predicting and providing where roadway infrastructure should be there's been a focus on modeling as the skill um, and there's a lot of interesting discussion around that, but um, I think at least the knowledge of the potential of other methods is important. And there's a volume that came out a little over 10 years ago by Gaber and Gaber around qualitative methods for planners. And I think that's a really useful volume and it has a narrative of how each method gives you a different slice of the cake. So um, I think uh, having students recognize there's multiple types of knowledge and having uh, humility around any particular type of method is, is a good starting point. We don't all need to be specialists in everything. But I think it's important for planners, regardless of their subspecialty, to at least um, see value in different types of methods for different types of questions. And I really like the idea of planning as a field where individuals get a solid background in interconnections, not just the subspecialty. Great. Thanks so much, Kate. Um, let's turn it over to questions from the audience. I think there's, I'll read one or two and then people can ha um, or can raise their hand if they want to ask questions live. Um, so Jack Lynch asked about uh, the impending red line extension mega project mentioned and uh, was, the, was the project mentioned by any of the focus group participants um, as a, and would that influence any of their travel behavior and their commute trips? Um, so, I I can't remember um, how frequently the red line extension came up. What came up a lot was slow bus service. Um, and there's some work um, by a woman, um, Gwendolyn Purvifoy. I, I'll, I'll type her name, because her last name, because I'm not sure on the pronunciation um but she maps out the inequities in the chicago system the l service goes beyond city limits on the north side a little bit on the west side to two of communities and stops um miles and miles um ahead away from the southern border so the red line extension would dramatically speed travel for many users who now have a slow component of travel. However, our work shows that the infrastructure has to come with other types of investments because if individuals don't feel safe accessing transit, then their mobility improvements are not as dramatic. Um, people adopt to those safety concerns by using cars to access transit. 
Um, and so there's some interest in transit oriented development, which has all kinds of interesting dimensions around gentrification and community empowerment, but there's also this tension of how do we enable access to the red line extension um, and have people feel safe. Um, but it's very much something desired by Southside residents um, um, in policy arenas. Um, Nick, thanks for putting Gwendolyn's full name in. Um, uh, so it would be marked improvement, um, but needs complementary policies as well. Great, uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, Nima, I don't know if you wanna answer your question. I can read it if you'd like. Um, but I might not do it justice. Oh, so sorry, Nick. Hey, Kate, how you doing? Um, I, it wasn't a question, Nick. It was just a comment. Classic academic. <laughs> no, no, I, I am so glad to see this work because like, like you pointed out, right? You know, talk to a transportation plan and if you're doing qualitative work, you're somehow written off. And so it's so wonderful actually to see Joe and Kate and you, Nick, you know, sort of starting to make real inroads into into this work because I, I think it's really crucial and I think it's really cr critical actually for our students to hear that this is important work and that this is, and the way in which, you know, this sort of, as Kate pointed out, the way in which these methods come together to generate new questions and to sort of, open up issues is super important. So yeah, no, thank you. It was just an, appreci an appreciative, appreciative comment. That's what it was. Well, that's very much accepted and so it's good to see you. Um, so we have another question. Uh, someone asked about sort of the trend in shared use mobility and mobility as a service and whether that can help vulnerable populations access transportation and mitigate spatial mismatch and how that might manifest in Chicago. Um, so there's actually a P so as an academic, I get to be a cynic. Um, so there's actually a PhD student in our department who's really interested in this. And I've seen some interesting European work too about mobility as a service. Um, and so, and there are some improvements that can be made that would have an impact. Um, but I don't know that platform integration in of itself is going to be enough. There's some um, integration that would be really helpful for uh, Southside residents. We have what's called the Metro Electric Line. And that's a line that uh, goes through many South Suburban communities as well as many locations within city limits. Um, and it is much faster to take Metro Electric if you're near it than to take the bus for 20 30 minutes to take the train for 30 minutes. And those are probably optimistic estimates. So those are probably what the model says, not what the reality is. Um, so fare integration um, is something that's been discussed. There is actually some interesting political infighting of county versus city and CTA, that's the L provider versus the commuter rail provider. So some integration would be helpful um, for some riders. Uh, but I'm not convinced that platform integration in of itself is going to solve this whole host of problems. That said, can it make a difference for some people sometimes? Certainly. Um, I'm really interested in scooters. I have a project on scooters and ride hailing because they have very different environmental externalities, but are both tech disruptors. Um, and one thing I'm really intrigued about is how different scooters are to use in moderate density locations. Um, each city has a different geography, but um, they're all racialized in the United States. And in Chicago, um, black and brown communities are much lower density than some of the more affluent communities. Um, and I, I'm just uh, a little cynical on the shared use model and a decentralized network as being as effective where density is lower. And so I think that's a good example of how could we rethink models to fit different contexts. I'm really interested in the idea of individual subsidies when instead of telling someone to walk to a scooter that's gonna be a half a mile away because you're not in a 
high density area? What about just subsidizing an individual scooter? So I think we have to think about different models with new technology and we should absolutely demand that they are equitably provided. But the same model provision that works in like these affluent, predominantly white, dense neighborhoods in Chicago is not gonna necessarily fit the needs in a different community. And that's why black and brown voices need to be central in shaping policy interventions. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, David, do you wanna ask your question? Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, thanks for uh, doing all this work in Chicago. I'm from Lakeview, uh, Belmont's my stop actually. I took the red line every day um, in high school pretty much. And then the express bus down to the Hyde Park. But um, but yeah, it, was, it strikes me just having used CTA a whole lot that in many respects, like the service quality is the same. You know, the red line's the red line, the buses are equally slow everywhere unless you're on the express bus. But like the, the platform, you know, but like the stops, just the, the infrastructure sort of like, you know, the stairs going up to the raised lines or down from the north side to the south side or like midway stops, the yellow line or whatever that is, green line, like are really bad on the south, comparatively, like just really much more run down, which speaks to your investment, uh, you know, uh, uh, analysis but but so I was just wondering like um, um, especially given I, I was wondering what you might was if you could uh, tie in like the raising of the bridges if there's some sort of sort of symbolic I uh, this past summer with the protests um, that like um, people from the south and southwest sides almost aren't allowed in the loop um, which then influences influences uh, perceptions of safety, uh, but also like, do you think a, if the critical mass of riders were to use the line, like that that number of 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 uh, L users would go up on those communities? I don't know if that's a really coherent question, but there there's a lot of rich material in there. Um, so one thing I would say that. Uh, Gwendolyn's work, um, if I was better, at, if I wasn't on, in the spotlight, I'd be multitasking, uh, finding that link to her work, but um, I, uh, if you look at her on Google Scholar, you'll find it that absolutely aligns with your observations that stations are maintained differently in, in different communities. Um, the red line is very speedy. Um, I was bragging before we got on the formal seminar that I can be downtown in 10 minutes once I get to the red line and I'm marginally on the south side. Um, the buses are slow across the city, um, but the distribution of the express buses um, aligned with some patterns like Hyde Park has good service, but so does Jeffrey, the Jeffrey Jump. Um, that's an express service that was actually, came up very favorably in our discussions. One, I mean, a big distinction is that North Side and white um, populations are concentrated near the L service. And um, because of the way investments are made in the United States, we have this dual system of transit provision. Um, there's a lot that I've been thinking about um, and in conversations with some advocacy groups around the way the mayor handled uh, the uprisings this summer. Um, there were many times this summer where transit service was shut down um, and many times where the bridges were raised. In a recent town hall with tribe she uh, said those were driven by the transit workers union safety concerns. The transit workers union president said they only asked once to pull the buses off the streets. Um, so the raising of the bridges, which cut off access in and out of the loop uh, for protesters and essential workers um, was a dramatic show of how mobility is politicized. Um, I am trying to, 
think and think with partners, whether there's some research and conversations we want to have again around that. But some of the way transit was deployed um, seemed not just about halting property destruction, um, which is so, which to me is far less of a priority than protecting human lives. But putting that aside, some of it seemed to just be aimed. The optic, I can't speak for the motivations of the decision makers, I wasn't in the room, but the optics and outcome was making it hard for people to get to protests and for essential workers who are predominantly black and brown to get out of the city and these were sudden changes. So transportation is used as a means of, an ex of exclusion and the bridges dramatically did that this summer. Um, and I think the work, I would lo love to refer you to Gwendolyn's work as well as uh, the untokening. If you Google them and Google Scholar Gwendolyn, there's, Gwendolyn has great resources on station inequities and the untokening has important work about mobility and immobility in the era of COVID. Thanks so much. I will post the, I think I posted the Gwendolyn's, some of her citations. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't like trying to be like, <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. I'm happy to, to, to be your, your, your uh, to take notes for you and, and help you out. Um, so I think uh, Nidhi has a, has a, one of our PhD students has a question. Uh, hi, Kate, and hi, hi, Nick. Thanks so much, Kate, for your presentation. And to Nick also on recently completing his qualitative study on car ownership. So uh, my uh, question is more like those of us who work in the qualitative tradition within planning tend to rely heavily on the work of scholars in cognate fields like sociology or anthropology. And that sort of also tends to define our collaborations. So now that you are entering into this qualitative research space, do you think you might change your partners from more traditional engineers or operations research folks to start collaborating with sociologists and anthropologists? And how would you think that would change politics within the academy? Um, those are some great questions and thank you for calling out uh, Nick's great piece on car ownership. Um, we could have a whole series on the complexities of car ownership and politics of justice. Um, so I, so Jesus, who I've collaborated with, um, his PhD is in planning, although he has some engineering backgrounds. I haven't actually collaborated that much with engineers. I think that's a reflection of my particular educational trajectory. Um, I've collaborate, I'm collaborating right now with political scientists. Um, I don't have a good answer that I can put together that um, is constructive on the fly. Um, but I would say bringing in uh, scholars from other social sciences traditions into the transportation arena, um, bringing more of those folks would be really important. Um, the field has a lot of engineering influence and um, economics influence, and I think balancing that with more social aspects and other methods could be part of changing the transportation subspecialty. But planning is such an interesting field as we have these different subcultures within it. Um, I'm just curious, what's your, but I think I would have collaborated more with engineers if I had gone somewhere else for my PhD and worked with a different advisor, but I just have, um, haven't taken that, that path. Uh, great, thanks so much, Kate. Uh, any other questions from the audience? I think we have time for a couple more or we can wrap up early. Okay, Yuna, you want to ask something? Yeah, um, thank you for the talk. It was really interesting to see how qualitative was brought into transportation. Um, I have a general question on qualitative um, research. Um, so I think qualitative research helps um, to look into the more nuanced situations of um, a given um, field. But at the same time, planning seems to be um, 
implementation is also really important in planning. And then there's always the resource um, budget restraints. And that kind of requires a, I, I think, those nuances. It's hard to reflect all those nuances that are found in qualitative um, research. So um, in your research findings, how are you planning to kind of reflect those um, findings in the implementation of these transportation planning practice, I guess? Um, so one thing I really struggle with is this uh, desire on the one hand to have impact and have actionable strategy and also this risk of rushing to solutions. And um, I may err on the side of being hesitant to have recommendations. Um, as a field, I'm concerned that planning propagates best practices when we don't even yet have evidence that they reach our end, um, and that planning and transportation in specific sometimes identifies projects without having a good rationale for them and backtracks the rationale. So I, I think there's a, a, obviously a vital role for implementation, but have my kind of role be, let's slow that down, let's not rush. Um, uh, let's make sure we're thinking about the right problems before we get to an implementation solution. But one strategy that's actionable is thinking precisely about budgets, whether it's a research budget or a planning project scope of work. What happens is outreach and engagement is often an afterthought or a small budget item. And I think we need to, we recognize how expensive, really innovative, important tools are, like interactive website, like that interactive website I showed, that caught, that merited resources to create and is really powerful. We have to invest on the other side when we're doing a planning project, outreach can't be a little budget item. To do it well, we have to, allocate the resources and time to it. Um, so I guess that would be my response is rethinking how we allocate um, money and time and not having engagement and qualitative methods be underinvested. But um, that may be an unrealistic solution, um, but at least is a conversation to be had to start changing things. I recently saw a grant opportunity. I'm not gonna name it, um, although probably some of you could figure it out. Um, I saw a grant opportunity that was saying, we're gonna do things differently. You're gonna get a little money to co-plan with the partner, because this is engaged research, and then you're gonna get the big research grant. But the amount of money to plan with the partner was inconsequential. So the budget didn't align with the stated values. Um, and so complaining about it is insufficient for change, but change requires that we, uh, we start having those conversations. Uh, sorry. Um, Rewa, you can go ask your question. Rewa, you can go ahead and ask your question. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for your presentation. So my question sort of builds on this qualitative, quantitative discussion, but is slightly more specific about like the tool that you shared about metropolitan accessibility mapping. Um, so I just wanted to ask, how is accessibility calculated as a percentage? Like what are the various factors that go into this calculation? So when we say that a certain neighborhood or a spatial unit has 57% accessibility, what does that mean on ground? So that's not my tool. So um, there's more documentation on the methods to that tool on the website. Um, but I believe that's the number of that type of opportunity that that uh, spatial zone can access within that time parameter. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, let's ask one more question from Jack. And sorry about the someone's calling me to pick up a prescription right when the other uh, question came in. So Jack, why don't you ask your question, and then we'll wrap up after that. Yeah, hi, Kate. Thanks. I, I have one more. Um, I asked one previously, um, but I'm also from Chicago. Um, so my question this time revolves kind of around the, the bicycling and particularly the Divi, uh, the Divi bike share. So obviously, kind of all of the data that has been shown um, regarding Divi, the vast amount of ridership occurs in pockets on the north and northwest side and, you know, more affluent and white neighborhoods, certainly. Um, and you had kind of discussed about how in these focus groups, many of your, many of the, the, the people there, um, particularly of uh, minority and lower income groups kind of wrote off the idea of biking and walking. And obviously that can be due to a number of factors regarding safety, uh, whether it be neighborhood safety or just lack of infrastructure. But I'm curious if you maybe got an impression that if infrastructure was improved or, or really is there anything that the city could do and Divi could do to improve um, and to get more people in these areas to bike uh, and to commute via bike? So I struggle a lot around this question because I, I like to bike. It's my favorite way of commuting. Um, but I also think it's important uh, to both remove barriers yet at the same time not prescribe behavior. Um, so the Divi system was rolled out dramatically and equitably. There is data that shows it was put on the north side. I saw a stat that drove me crazy. They were bragging about the program and said the majority of people within a half mile were people of color. But it was like 53% when it's like when the city of Chicago is more than 66% people of color. So it was disproportionately accessible to white people, um, even if it was majority black and brown. Um, so I absolutely think Divi needs to be on the south and west sides and it should be accessible. However, I wonder if we should listen to south and west side folks about what their priorities should be. Um, my research collaborator has a different model of bike libraries. Is Divi the right model? It, there's racialized geographies. So distances are farther apart on the south and west side. And at first, Divi had a limit of 30 minutes for trips before they were charged. Um, and that reflected what it was like on the north side. Um, and they expanded it, but that wasn't in the initial conversation. Um, and I just, I, I'm not as enthusiastic about shared models being a priority solution um, in black and brown communities. Absolutely, they should be available. Absolutely, they should be thought of differently. The planning should have started with input by black and brown communities, and then we would have seen different program parameters. But I also think rather than say Divi is the solution, we have to ask black and brown communities what, it, what would make biking more appealing. Um, and, it, and a shared system may not be the universal solution even as it should be equitably accessible. Oh, um, David has mentioned air quality. That's something Little Village Environmental Justice Organization brings up a lot. There is um, Google Hillco and Little Village, and you'll see some disturbing dust. Um, so air quality is also an issue, although that didn't come as much up in our focus groups as much as traffic danger. And now you're gonna wrap up. Sorry, I was waiting for you to call on me. <laughs> you're you're the showrunner, so I didn't want to intrude. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation and a reminder about the political nature of the choice of research methods. Because um, in a way, what you have found is hardly surprising. Uh, <laughs> and it's, uh, it's, it's there, and it could have been there for people to see and to learn about or to think about had they wanted to know and think about uh, those particular populations. So in a way by um, much like how planning has traditionally 
thought about a general public interest by aggregating at a large end scale to spatial statistics or census or other kinds of survey methods, we lose a lot of the granularity of the specific groups on whose behalf we should be thinking and planning for. So um, I don't know whether the change of um, methods, how much impact that will be because it seems to be part of a larger system in which um, the choice of methods has long played into and benefited the distribution of land use and housing and, and not just transit but really about housing and land use choices and this plays into that you know we don't necessarily want to change our housing distribution and so this uh, no know, knowing this um, you know it's it's not surprising so I, I don't know whether the change of the methods, I think maybe it can play into the pedagogy and therefore into the changing mindset of how we think and plan, but actual change would necessarily be of a much more political nature of mobilization and grassroots advocacy um, and, and congressional advocacy for change in how we distribute funding. So thank you so much for calling that out and um, Thank you everybody else for joining in this lively discussion. If we can all unmute and give Dr. Loa a warm round of applause. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank I enjoyed you. all your questions and it was a pleasure to be back in the Cornell community. Bye everyone. <laughs>